One hit. <laughs> God damn it. Dead. She is dead. Hello again, this is going to be part two where we look at the Unity UT181A. In part one, the meter was damaged from a single hit of an ESD event. A few of you have asked about what the transient looks like coming off of this. I think what I'd like to do is go over a little bit about what that waveform looks like and how that compares to some of the standards. So first, if we look at the meters that have failed this test, so this is the first column, and we can see the Unity UT61D had failed that, the Unity UT61E failed, the Xtech 430 had failed, the Vichy VC99 failed, and the Unity UT181 of course failed. Let's take a look at some of the meters that have actually passed this test. So first we have the Hioki, this is the model DT4252. This is the manual for the Hioki and we can see under standards it not only meets the 61010, it meets the 61326 which is an EMC standard. This is the Fluke 101, again this is their lowest cost meter. And again, we look at the standards that this meter meets, and we can see 61010. But then beneath here, under electromagnetic environment, 61326. Looking at the Bryman BM869S, again, this meter had no problems with these tests. And we can see under safety, you know, it meets the 61010. But if we look under EMC, 61,326 and here we have the manual for the UT181 and we can see in here they claim safety standard IEC 61,010 but what you don't see is any of the EMC standards so what's exactly in that 61,326 standard well, I have a copy of it here or at least the page that I'm interested in and we can see under enclosure it's listing electrostatic discharge an electromagnetic field voltage dips burst surge conducted RF so there's quite a few tests that this specification calls out again the one we're interested in is the ESD and we can see again it's a 4 kV contact discharge or an 8 kV air discharge and again it's calling out criteria B so the IEC standard 61000-4-2 is a fairly common standard for ESD. So let's have a look at that. So again, this is 61000-4-2, uh, the 2009 version. So looking at level 2, which is a 4 kV contact, they're requiring a peak current of 15 amps with a rise time of 800 picoseconds plus or minus 25%. At 30 nanoseconds, the waveform should decay to roughly 8 amps. And at 60 nanoseconds, it should decay all the way down to 4 amps. Next page is kind of showing what the waveform looks like. So, again, this is a contact, level 2. And we can see the current rises all the way to the 15 amps. It's not as simple as just looking at the open circuit voltage with this. So a lot of people had actually asked about that. As I laid this thing on the table with a non-conductive surface and I basically pushed these two together until it started to spark and then I measured that gap with a dial indicator to get a rough idea and the open circuit voltage for this is roughly 15,000 volts and if we look at the IEC standard for an air discharge they're calling out an 8 kV so they want a 4 kV for direct contact so this thing probably exceeds that by a fair amount but what I'm concerned about is really the energy coming off of this so to look at the current waveform normally you're going to have what they call a target and you can see I've got a couple of homemade ones here typically at a real company where they're running these tests they're not going to have something homemade like this but for hobby use this is what we're going to use this is basically two FR4 boards you can see they're quite thick and I actually have resistors embedded inside of the circuit board. So at each one of these solder joints there's a resistor and it's soldered on both sides of the circuit board. One side here is ground and the other side is our target. 
So the total resistance of this target is 2 ohms. So if I put 2 volts across this, I'm basically at 1 amp. And then you can see I have several attenuators on here. In this case, I'm testing with 26 dB. And then they call for a maximum of a 1 meter cable coming off of this going back to the oscilloscope. In my case, I actually have a secondary clamp before it actually goes to the front end of the oscilloscope. I tested the grill starter using a half a meter of RG400. RG400 is what the standard recommends using. It's a low loss coax. Of course, it's going to take a very fast oscilloscope. You need a high sample rate as well as a very high bandwidth to look at a signal that's going to be sub nanosecond. So I'm using a LaCroix 8500A. This is a 5 gigahertz front end and it samples at 20 giga samples per second. When I ran this thing, which I had done before, unfortunately I hadn't saved the data for it, so I repeated the test. But with a direct contact, this igniter only puts out about one amp peak, and the pulse width is only about five nanoseconds total. So if we look at our graph, basically what we're seeing coming off of this gun is going to be a little one amp peak and it's going to decay here within five nanoseconds it's not a whole lot but long and behold some meters do fail with it some of the meters like this Vichy VC99 of course this failed and again there are no safety or EMC specifications called out for this meter so while on the internet you'll read in a lot of forums people will talk about the safety of the meters I really am more concerned about the robustness I don't want a meter at home that I hit this thing with a real simple static discharge and it destroys the meter. I'm actually more concerned about the meters that would meet the EMC standard. The location where I live things will get quite dry and we have carpeting in the house so you walk across the carpeting, touch your probes and the meter dies. To me that's not acceptable. So it's very important for me when I'm looking at a meter like the Bryman that it actually calls out that it meets this EN61326 standard. Looking at the design of the UT181A, if we look at the input jack we can see it's got four PTCs. There's two sets of two in series and then these go off to a MOV and then these MOVs tie to a common MOV which then goes off to the return side. The MOVs are in part number 07D 751K. So this is a 10% part and these are rated at 38 joules and they have a maximum clamping voltage of 1240 volts. They're rated for 620 volts DC operation and 460 volts AC. All three of these are identical so of course you have two of these in series essentially. If you hit a transient here for example of course that's going to pass through both of these so this one's going to take the majority of the stress. But for the level of uh, transient that we're supplying, uh, you know, again, there's basically no energy. We're nowhere near this uh, 38 joules, I can tell you that. Even if I hit it with my homemade surge generator, we're well below that uh, 30 joules. And these devices are protected with the upstream PTCs anyway. So in some of the previous videos, I've talked about the differences between the gas discharge tubes, MOVs, and TVSs. And one of the things I'd mentioned was the gas discharge tubes are quite slow and they would require additional downstream protection because we're looking at transients, especially with ESD, that are going to be sub nanosecond rise times. And, you know, in this case, the pulse duration, which is only five nanoseconds. So, you know, a gas discharge tube is not going to respond to that waveform and it's just going to let it right on through. The MOVs, on the other hand, will actually switch quite fast. But what ends up happening, if there's any inductance in the circuit board here, or we end up with long traces, or if, for example, if they connected a sensitive signal to this side of the trace and it's got to run all the way over here before it actually gets back to the ground terminal, we could develop a potential across the ground and that could cause damage. So it's very important that the layout for this area be done correctly. What we do want is somehow to return all the energy that's in here for that transient back to the ground. Let's say we were going to attempt to modify this meter to pass these tests. The things that I would be looking at are the clearances around some of the parts. I'd be looking at that return path for the MOVs. What can I do to reduce the inductance in that area? And we need stuff to switch fast. Somebody mentioned like putting a MOV right across the input. And there actually is a meter out there that is built that way. 
The problem with that is once that mob starts to conduct, all that current is going to flow right through the test leads. You know, and you don't want to risk having that kind of current going through your leads. <clears throat> Another member talked about possibly putting a fuse in line with it to try to pop the fuse if the mob starts conducting. I don't like the idea of having a fuse out here that I'm going to have to replace every time. That's the whole idea of having these PTCs out there with this clamp. So what I'm saying, if this is done correctly, this should survive this transient. One of the things you'll see with the SD protection is they'll use a stack ceramic capacitor to suppress it. Um, that can work. Um, the MOV certainly can work. You know, they're fast enough. They normally have enough internal capacitance that they can quench it. So I think what we'd have to do is actually take a look at this, look at the layout, and then decide if we could actually mod it. But the first thing we'd have to do is get the meter working again. Somebody had mentioned that it looked like the unit was still working at the time and I had hit it with the transient. <clears throat> if you look at the video, you'll actually see the digits kind of on the display and they'll sit there for quite some time. And it takes it a while to blank out. But I can assure you this meter is totally dead. So I spent a little bit of time I uh, wrote down all the part numbers for all the components and then I tried to find data sheets for everything and I started to reverse engineer bits and pieces of this and it appears the way it kind of works there's a MOSFET and that MOSFET is sitting here this is our battery inlet port and so when you push the uh, power button this MOSFET enables power up into this chip here and this is the 3.3 volt switch mode power supply this is the inductor for it this thing's running at like 2 megahertz or something uh, everything is working fine as a matter of fact I can see the supply voltages and everything power up on this thing <clears throat> but when I look at the output of the regulator here I am not getting 3.3 volts I was wondering if something was lugging this thing down or just what was going on but the closer I started looking at it it appears that this IC chip here is definitely damaged. So unfortunately, until I get the power to actually come back up on the meter, I can't really go any farther with it. On the plus side, this is actually a common part. It's readily available. So I placed an order with DigiKey. And here's our box. It's just arrived. So what I'm going to do is I'll remove this part. And we'll go ahead and replace it and then we'll check to see if we have a 3.3 volt power supply back online. I think before we do anything we're going to remove this plastic bezel. So probably don't want to melt that. You can see there's a nice flex strip in here. Just kind of slide all that out of the way and We'll just go ahead and pull that part. This is the component right here that we're interested in. You can see that we've gone ahead and removed that. Next I'll go ahead and solder in the new part. Alright, here's our new uh, regulator. Looks like everything stayed sealed just fine. A little strip of new ones. So I think, put this down, I'm going to have to do this under the microscope. Okay, so I've gone ahead and soldered down the new part. And I've checked continuity of all the pins. Everything looks pretty good under the microscope. Now this is the actual part that I was looking at. Now this is a uh, TPS 62172, made by TI. But uh, yeah, basically when I would turn this thing on, you could see, you know, the FET supply and the input power to the chip. Grounds were all intact. This thing just basically refused to switch. I didn't see any problem with any of the output loading. It looked all fine. So I believe we just damaged the front end of this thing here. And somehow the FET that's actually feeding this had survived that. Because I could, again, see some of the other power supplies coming up. Just this one here was down. Alright, so we'll see here if this thing will actually power up now. Keep our fingers crossed. 
Oh, there's life. Data logging multimeter. Ha! Well, there we go. Of course, I have no idea if anything else is broken. I think the next step now will be to uh, put some screws in this thing so it stays together. And I'll go ahead and run a functional test on this. Let's see if we can turn it back off. Eh, hey, alright. Looks like all the screws are still in here. One ohm, looks good. 50, good. 100, looks good. 1K, looks good. 10, looks good. 100K, looks good. There's our mag, that looks good. 10 mag, looks good. Continuity test looks good. Conductance test, this will be a 100 mag. Got my fingers on there, looks good enough. This will be a 1 giga ohm, looks good. You keep your fingers away from it, certainly with the covers off right now. All right, diode mode, there's our short, looks good. Single diode, good. Two, three diodes, that all looks fine. Fasted mode. So our 150 picofarad looks good 0.1 microfarad that looks good here's our one nanofarad looks good one microfarad good and 10 microfarads looks pretty good dc 5 volts and that looks good let's just try our AC input, we'll hook it up to our transient generator and yep that looks good let's see about the AC mode yep looks fine so it appears the only thing that we've damaged is just that switch mode controller chip so I'm not sure why that failed. I think that's the next thing I want to do is have a look and see if I can figure out what exactly went on with that. Let's check the backlight here. Looks good. That all functions. While I had the meter apart, I was kind of looking at what I could do to maybe mitigate this problem. Usually when I'm playing with high voltage, there's a few things I want to use. Uh, one is going to be Teflon. This is a type of plastic. It's very slippery. Corona dope. And the last tool of choice, our trusty Dremel. We can see the tip on this fairly fine. It's actually quite sharp. And I've cut a lot of circuit boards with this cutter. We'll see how this meter fares after I do a little modding to it. So before I get into modifying the meter, a few things I want to go over. First, I'm not suggesting that anyone ever attempt to modify a meter. Unfortunately, because of the safety issues and making the mods, I think that this is going to be one case where I'm not really going to show you what's going to happen. I did the same thing when I developed the transient generators. I talked a little bit about the hardware, showed you some block diagrams, how they could work. Recommended that you read the IEC standards if you had more interest in the topic. So why modify the meter at all? You know, I'm basically doing exactly what I'm telling you don't do. Well, when I originally was looking to buy the Bryman, again, I had looked at what Fluke had to offer. I had looked at the 289. I wasn't happy with the battery life, and I certainly wasn't happy with the boot-up times. And now that I've gone ahead and actually compared this meter against it, I can tell you I wouldn't have been happy with the graphing software that's included in the meter. So, you know, this meter actually has some very nice features over the top of that 289. You know, it's just not robust. I plan on keeping this meter assuming that I'm able to make the mods and have the meter survive. The other thing I should point out is obviously you know I'm actually developing these generators from the ground up so I actually have some skill playing around with hardware I'm quite comfortable with it so let's just go ahead with it and we'll see what we can do. Okay the meter has now been modified I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. So I think what we're going to do is go ahead and rerun this test. But I think before we do that, one of the questions people had asked about was this Syntec meter. Of course, I've ran these meters a few times. They never do very well. 
but lo and behold I have never actually static tested one. So this is brand new. I picked this up just for this testing. <sighs> Dead out of the box it looks like. Oh. Uh, kind of works. Boy, you hate to uh, take this thing apart just to repair this, but unfortunately, I think to really run the test, that's what we're going to have to do. Watch! Yeah, I think that's our problem. I think that's supposed to loop around the zebra strip there. Uh, much better. Wow, look at that current shot now. Well, wow, these have definitely changed again. This is our new fuse. I believe that that's a different style as well versus what used to come with these. So this is a upgraded version, I think. Upgraded a little bit more cheap. So this is our input here. It goes around this hoop and then up into the switch and probably straight into the IC. You know some IC chips they can actually handle the ESD events just on their own. So we'll go ahead and repeat this test using the Harbor Freight Meter. We'll run it through all of its modes. Again five transients positive and negative. Alright, this will be in diode mode, and this is with a short. <laughs> so that does not work. Let's try resistance. That's with a short. This is 20k ohms. Again, that's with a short. 200k, 2 meg. Just got hooked up to my transient generator and I'll go ahead and enable the AC line volts and we get nothing out of it and nothing in the DC volts and so we definitely damage the meter so again let's keep this in mind Harbor Freight gives these away basically for free but I would not expect a meter like this to fail at $300 I can see it with my eyes, obviously, but uh, we'll see if the camera picks that up. Okay, both meters are in their DC mode, and I've got them attached to the high voltage power supply. We'll go ahead and turn this up and make sure that we still have the same dynamic range. This is 122 volts. It's roughly 800 volts. You can see both meters reading the same value. So again, at 900 volts. And we can see both meters reading roughly the same value. All right, we'll go ahead and functional test it. So again, dead short, and one diode, two diodes, three diodes. This be 150 picofarad, and one nanofarad. This will be 0.1 microfarad. This will be one microfarad, and 10 microfarads. And this is an open, this is 0.5 ohms, one ohm, 50 ohms, 100 ohms, 1K, 10K, 100K, 1 meg, 10 meg, continuity test, 100 meg, it's 1 giga ohm, it's our thermocouple input, again we're just using our box for this, this is 1 millivolt applied, 
This is one volt applied. And again, this is off of my fluke reference. And this is 10 volts applied. This is a one half volt sine wave. And this is with a 5 volt sine wave applied. This is at roughly 100 hertz. We'll just connect it to our RF generator. It's roughly 51 megahertz. And this is roughly 60 megahertz. So the meter appears to function just fine now. Unfortunately, I ended up having to cut the circuit board to make this work. But uh, as you can see, the performance is pretty good with it. Definitely survives ESD testing now. Now that the unit passes ESD, let's just see how it does on the transient generator. So for this first test, this is 1 kV per division and 100 microseconds per division. So we can see roughly it's 100 microsecond full with half height, 1000 volts peak. Again, this will be a 2 ohm source impedance. This will be positive and negative transients. 5 each. Okay, that's it. I'll go ahead and functional test it. Okay, the meter held up just fine. Just to give you an idea, if we include the 181A, there were 29 meters so far tested using the new generator. Five of those meters, including this one, failed ESD. One of them failed the 220 volt line. So that's 11 meters so far that this thing is outperformed and you can see we are now at two divisions and still 100 microsecond full with half height so 2 kV okay that's it I'll go ahead and functional test it Pass is functional, no problems at all. So at 2000 volts, we had failed one meter, and at 1500, there were three of them that failed. So that's 15 out of 29 meters, so roughly half of them had failed by this point. So that's pretty good. It's better than about half of the meters I've tested so far. Okay, we've reprogrammed the generator. This is uh, 2000 volts per division or roughly 4,000 volts and again we'll be applying both positive and negative transients All right, that's it. We'll go ahead and functional test it. Well, that's it. Looks like it passes at 4,000 volts, plus and minus. That's a 100 microsecond full width half height, 2 ohm source impedance. So, it's gone from basically failing in one hit of ESD up to the top 11 or so. Today we're going to start where we left off, and we're going to turn the generator all the way up. This is going to be roughly 5.8, 5.9 kV. We can see that on the scope here. This is roughly 2,000 volts per division, 100 microseconds per division. Again, we're going to apply that transient in all modes of the meter, and we'll see if it survives. If that's it we'll go ahead and functional test it okay I just finished functional testing it the meters just fine all right the meters just fine no problems whatsoever just kind of a recap here when we look at what meters have survived at this point 
We have the Hayoki DT4252, the Unity 15C, the Fluke 115, the Ampro AM510, the Fluke 101, the Fluke 17B Plus, the Bryman BM869S, the Fluke 107, and the Radio Shack 220087. So for this next test, we've broken out the original generator and the scope right now is set for 2,000 volts per division. You can see we have an 8,000 volt transient. Again, these are roughly 50 microsecond full with half height. Let's just see if our modified 181A can handle the same level of transient as an unmodified Hioki. That's it. Let me just go ahead and functional test this and we'll see if it still passes. Okay, the meter passes functional just fine after that. So here we can see the scope is currently set for 2000 volts per division with a minus 8000 volt offset. And we are currently 20 microseconds per division. So we can see we're roughly seven and a half divisions or about 15,000 volts. And this is again about a 50 microsecond full width half height. So without strapping the output of the transient generator differently, uh, this is the maximum I can get for a full width half height. So let's subject the modified 181A to this transient and we'll see if it'll survive it. All right, that's it. This is 5KY's UT61E. Again, this meter was also damaged with static discharge. We'll be a little nice to it. Let's just uh, put this thing into AC mode. So again, this is what I was just subjecting this meter to. We'll let this thing zap while I functional test this UT181. So yeah, the 181A, 100% functional. Well, that is the limit of our generator. Like I say, I could restrap this thing to run a 100 microsecond full width half height, but I don't think I'm going to do it. I think I proved the point. I think to finish this video up, I'm going to do a comparison between my Bryman and the Unity. Hopefully this will give you an idea how much the accuracy has been affected by the modifications I've made to the meter. So again, this is driving off of my fluke reference, and we're set to currently 10 volts. And this is with one volt applied. And this is with one millivolt applied. This is with roughly a half volt sine wave applied. Both meters reading roughly the same frequency. I'm using a piece of coax right now is why this is a little different. And this is at 50 ohms, 100 ohms, 1K, 10K, 
100K, 1 meg, 10 meg. Here we're looking at conductance, and this is 100 mega ohm. Here we have 1 giga ohm. This is with a 150 picofarad capacitor. Here we're looking at a 10 microfarad capacitor. Currently it looks like I have about 22 hours of runtime on the first charge. And we can see the battery's gone down just a slight amount. But yeah, I think you could probably get about 40 hours of operation between charges with this. It looks pretty good. It's definitely acceptable for what I'm going to use the meter for. Again, for the Brahman, I just changed the battery in it. And the original battery had been in there since uh, about August. I think it's when I bought this meter. So quite a few months of operation on a single battery. But it's nice, I mean, being able to recharge this thing. So we'll see how that works out. Just to finish this video up, the one thing I'd like you to walk away from this is if you're concerned at all about transients like ESD, if you're in an area that's dry and you have a lot of carpeting or something, so you end up with a lot of static discharges, you probably don't want a meter like this that's very sensitive to that type of environment. I think what you want to look for is a meter that actually has been rated to IEC 61326, which is an EMC standard, which will call out the actual ESD test. Again, when I was testing with the grill starter, you could see that the amount of energy in that grill starter was quite a bit lower than what the IEC standard calls for. So yeah, I have no doubt that uh, if you had a meter that met that standard, it's probably going to pass that test just fine. Unfortunately, the meters from Unity, like the 61E and the 181A, don't call out that standard. And obviously, they fail it. So if you're looking for a new meter and you're concerned about that, you probably want to be looking for something like this Bryman, that Hioki. All the flukes that I've looked at all support that standard. Many other ones do. Just check the manual first and know what it is that you're getting before you buy it. So yeah, okay, so this meter's been repaired. Obviously, it's still very accurate. And it's probably now more robust than most of the meters I have in the office here. You know, 15,000 volts, 50 microsecond full width half height. That's a pretty big punch. You saw what it did to this 61E. So, yep, it's definitely been hardened by U.S. engineering. So there you go. So I hope you found the video useful. I'd like to say hello to all the new followers. Glad to have you on board. Till the next meter.